And here we are coming to you live from our top secret broadcasting bunker here at Area 52. This is Pastor Mike, and I am online, and I am live with you today. I, I just looked at my Bible, Matthew chapter 24, and I just saw something there I never really paid much attention to. The grouping together in Matthew 24 of, of two verses. I'll tell you I'll tell you what I'm what I'm thinking here in just a little bit. We're going to look at um, some things from Matthew 24. I've got a couple news things to deal with. Obviously, we have to talk about the stupid bowl and uh, not about the game itself. Uh, some of the commercials were just a little weird. The halftime show. Now I did not watch the halftime show until probably about an hour ago. I, I didn't watch it. I just, I don't know, I, I DVR'd or recorded the Super Bowl. When we got done with our church service, we had a great, great service Sunday night. When it got done with that, went home, rewound it, and watched it. I skipped over the commercials, most of them. I skipped to the halftime show and just watched the football game. Um, and, and you need to understand Next year's halftime show, it's, it's got to be bigger than this year's halftime show. This year's halftime show had to be bigger than last year's show, and then the one before that, and then the one before that, and then the one before that. I don't think we'll ever have a Super Bowl where they invite um, the Hooterville High School marching band to perform for the halftime show. I don't think they'll ever do that. Uh, so are they, and let me just say this: when you're dealing with rock and roll artists, is there something diabolical about their songs and their performances? Absolutely, there's no doubt about it. Uh, Madonna gets up there with her ISIS dress on. She looks like the uh, she looks like uh, Lilith, the owl goddess. Yeah, we get that. The closing ceremony of the 2012 London Olympics. Um, was all about the rise of the Phoenix. This year, halftime show, you got Katy Perry, who, from what I could tell, she's not singing any new songs that she's just coming out with. It was sort of a montage of songs that she had already done. And um, one of the first one that came out, as, and most of you caught this, and you're going, duh. That's no, that's no secret to us, and it's not because we believe the Bible. We know what the Bible says. We believe the Bible, and we know that we should expect to see things like this or worse, much worse, in the days to come. But Katy Perry comes out, makes her grand entrance on stage, clothed with fire, riding a beast. That's how she comes out. Here is this woman clothed in scarlet, and she's riding a beast. Uh, in this case, um, here's she's singing the um, the title song from her album "Roar." As in, I, and I'm assuming this is supposed to be a lion or a tiger. It's a tiger on the back of the, um, well, on the, it's on the front of, of uh, her album cover. I was thinking back, she was wearing this uh, denim jacket with this tiger stitched into it. Not a real tiger. Not a real tiger, okay? You don't want to walk around with a denim coat with a real tiger stitched to the back. That's, that's, that's not good. Uh, anyway, this, the song... If you know anything about Katy Perry, if you know where she came from, uh, and her mom and dad were in attendance, her mom and dad are pastors, both of them, kind of. Uh, these, these people are, were charismatic, uh, Kenneth Hagin type, Kenneth Copeland, Perry Stone type people, uh, still are. They raised this young lady in church, and um, they raised her to sing 
music in church. Now I don't know what kind of I don't know what kind of church it was. I don't know what kind of music it was, but this is where she began. And um, if you've ever seen the documentary, um, what was it? They they sold their soul for rock and roll. Um, you'll see that a lot of entertainers today, especially rock and roll, country, or whatever, they got their start singing in church. That's where they that's where they began. But um, at some point. Katy Perry even said in an interview, I guess I sold my soul to the devil, you know, so now I'm like singing all this stuff. Um, listen to the lyrics of the song that she came out as the woman is riding the beast, Revelation 17. The lyrics are, I used to bite my tongue and hold my breath, scared to rock the boat and make a mess, so I sat quietly, agreed politely, I guess that I forgot I had a choice, I let you push me past the breaking point. I stood for nothing, so I fell for everything. And I I see a lot of teenage rebellion in this, as what I see. And her mom and dad sitting there at the stupid bowl, listening to her sing this. You held me down, but I got up. Hey! Already brushing off the dust. You hear my voice. You hear that sound like thunder gonna shake the ground. You held me down, but I got up. Hey! Get ready, cause I've had enough. I see it all. I see it now. I got the, and here's the chorus. I got the eye of the tiger, a fighter, dancing through the fire. Stop, 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 stop. Right here. Stop right here. I'm going to throw in absolutely free to this Pastor Mike Online live broadcast a um, an email that was sent to me it was an email that was um, that came from Perry the Stones website and his quote unquote ministry or his business I should say his 501c3 business Uh, this is an email one of these email alerts to get people to pay attention to Perry the Stone He says, what I'm about to say is not embellished nor in any way an exaggeration. The greatest presence of God I have felt in over 20 years was released in the altar services of Reformation worship and rejoicing continued for hours and people were carried out of the building to be driven home drunk under the influence of the Holy Spirit. Now he quotes, he says, see Acts 2, 1 through 18. That's what he tells you to do. I want you to turn there. Somebody uh, asked me this question the other day. It's a good question, but it's it's actually a, a, a simple one. Okay, in Acts chapter two, he's referring to he's referring to the event of the apostles and the disciples there speaking in known languages, unknown to the speaker, known. To the hearer. That's what he's he wants you to think now. Perry the Stone wants you to think that God's Spirit, when it comes on you, it makes you a drunkard. That's what he that's what he just said. Let me read it again. Um rejoicing continued for hours, and people were uh, were carried out of the building to be driven home drunk under the influence of the Holy Spirit. Let me tell you where he gets this from. Watch this. New wine in the Bible is always non-corrupted. It does not have the corruption of leaven in it, which means no alcohol. It won't make you drunk. So watch this. In And somebody said, well, you know, in Acts chapter 2, they were accused... They were accusing them of being drunk with new wine. Wouldn't that mean like new wine can make you drunk? No, listen to it. Okay? Uh, Where is it? Others, verse 13 of Acts chapter 2, others mocking said, these men are full of new wine. 
And then uh, Peter, standing up with the eleven, lifted up his voice and said unto them, Ye men of Judah, and all ye that dwell at Jerusalem, be this known unto you, and hearken to my words, for these are not drunken as ye suppose, seeing it is but the third hour of the day. I've heard, I've heard Kenneth Hagin twist this verse around. Because Peter specifically said these men are not drunken. They're not drunken. They're not drunk. It's only the third hour of the day. Come on. Good grief. Which is, what, about 9 o'clock in the morning? And Hagen takes this, twists it, and he emphasizes the, the part there, as ye suppose. Kenneth Hagen says, well, obviously, they were drunk, they were just not drunk the way men suppose people get drunk. That's not what it says here. These are not drunken, as ye suppose. You think they're drunk. I'm telling you they're not. Seeing as but the third hour of the day. They mocked them, saying, these men are full of new wine. Now, here's the joke. Here's the mockery. New wine is non-alcoholic grape juice. The joke, this is what I see. The joke here is the men standing around this event are mocking them saying they're full of new wine. And look, they're acting drunk. I mean, that's what I see here. These men are full of new wine. New wine does not make you drunk. New wine is, as you can imagine, it's from the pressing of the grape. That's, that's new wine. The word wine means from the vine, vino. And you have to look at the story to determine whether or not it's alcoholic or non-alcoholic. And besides that, if, if these men were drunken under, let's say, a spirit, then it violates a lot of other places in the Bible where God said, do not be drunk with wine. Wine is a mocker, Solomon said. Strong drink is raging, and whosoever is deceived thereby is not wise. So I don't think they were drunk. I know for a fact they were not drunk. Perry the Stone wants you to think that. Now, let's get back to his email. Because here's what um, here's what um, Katy Perry was singing. I got the eye of the tiger, a fighter, dancing through the fire. That's what she was singing. I don't know how close I was to how that song sounds, but it might have been pretty close. Dancing through the fire, and here's Perry the Stone saying, um, All of the messages were timely and eye-opening, including several illustrated messages. Chad Daniels preached uh, using a 16-foot anaconda to show how that if sin is not dealt with, the little things in your life will grow into big things. Partners said, my Sunday night illustrated message on Satan's weapons of intimidation was one of the most significant in several years. Over 200 were baptized in the Holy Spirit, and several astonishing miracles of healing were documented. I'm making CDs and DVDs available. Now, you listen to this. Listen to what he says now. If you want just the message, get the five CDs. For additional per portions of the service and the message, acquire the DVDs. Sunday morning will include, here we go, you ready? The fire tunnel prayer time. Fire tunnel. Does that ring a bell with anybody? Um, uh, Bill Johnson, the anti-Bethel pastor, Bethel Church, Redding, California. I don't know if he started it. But he's been using it, and I'll tell you what it is. The fire tunnel is you get all these people lined up on two sides, and you get these people who are going to immerse themselves in into the flames of fire. Can you think of can you think of a mythological bird that does that like every five hundred years? The fire tunnel is making your children to pass through the fire. That's what that is. It is a practice that was an abomination to God. It is a practice that at its core, according to the Bible, 
does not honor God, it does not please God, so he releases this fire anointing on them. It angers God because the, the ritual is geared toward Molech, not Jehovah God. So Perry's doing fire tunnel prayer lines. And then he says... Um, you can get the uh, the CDs for thirty bucks. Five audio CDs. Now let me let me tell you let me tell you what he gets from five CDs. He gets about twenty five bucks a set. The CDs we buy them in bulk. I don't know that we buy them the same bulk as he gets, but we get them fairly cheap. About twenty five cents for a blank CD. And then uh, Bonnie and Roy come over here, always feed them lunch. And they make CDs and stick them in the little envelopes. And we put them in the mail and send them out to everybody. A package that we send out uh, for our watchers packets costs about $2.35, somewhere around in there. You're giving him 30 He's keeping 25 He's making a $25 profit off of that $30. And let me tell you about the DVDs. The DVDs he's selling for $60. Now, let me tell you the little scam about that one. Okay, this is pretty good. The CDs cost us about 25 cents a copy. Some to every now and then we can get them for 23. The DVDs, they're like way higher than that. They cost about 28 cents a piece. About 3 to 4 cents more than a CD does. And yet, and, and, and I'll say this, we can put more on a DVD than we can a CD. We can put about an hour of audio at CD audio quality on one CD. When we give out our Bible studies, we use MP3s because you can crunch the, the, the sound file down to a smaller size and put more on there. But you're actually getting a longer, you can get about two hours or so on a DVD, but you get video. And so when you buy the video set for 60 bucks, he's keeping $55 for profit on that. Not bad. But listen to what he says. Let me say that the demonstration of the power of God is so strong that if you're not used to seeing such moves of God and were raised to not believe in the manifestations and demonstrations of the Spirit, this could seem to you as spiritual overload to experience. Thus, order the messages on CD. In other words, you know what he's, you know what he's just saying here? If you've never seen anything like this, don't watch the DVDs because you'll probably go, these people are nuts, man. These people are crazy. Just get the CDs where we edit that out and you don't know it. The fire tunnel. We, he said, we wanted to document the moment the kids were touched by God's... But he even admits in the email that they were passing children through the fire. Why do people support this stuff? Let's get back to Katy Perry's lyrics. She says, um, I got the eye of the tiger, a fighter, dancing through the fire. Because I am a champion and you're going to hear me roar. Louder, louder than a lion. Because I am a champion and you're going to hear me roar. Oh, 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 you're going to hear me roar. Now I'm floating like a butterfly, stinging like a bee. Nobody can beat up Muhammad Ali. That's pretty good, wasn't it? I earned my stripes. I went from zero to my own hero. You held me down, but I got up already brushing off the dust. It sounds like a serpent to me. You hear my voice, you hear that sound, like thunder going to shake the ground. You held me down, but I got up. Get ready, because I've had enough. I see it all. I see it now. Katy Perry is all about releasing everybody. Um, she, she comes out 
a representative of mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. I'll probably use this graphic in an upcoming Watchman broadcast. I'm dealing with a, just a new series we started called Babylon's Mystery. And I am, I have been working on the script for parts two, three, four, five, six, and seven, and eight. I don't know how long it'll take. Uh, for quite a while now, and I've, I'm seeing things in the Bible that I just never really paid attention to. But it's there. And um, you, if you want to understand more about this symbolism or the idea of symbolism itself, why do they use symbols? Why doesn't, why doesn't Katy Perry and all of these people come out, stand before the crowd, and say, can I get everybody's attention for a minute? I'm here to announce that me and all of the band members, we worship Satan. He is our Lord. And we drink blood at, uh, at uh, satanic festivals. And um, we would like to invite you to come forward to receive Satan as your personal destroyer. And by the way, we can get you pre-signed up for the Mark of the Beast when, when it's ready to come out. We can already go ahead and sign you up for it now, and we can put you at the front of the line. Do I have anybody? Now, to be honest with you, I, I think there would be people going, oh, me first, me first, me first. But that's not how they talk. It's the nature of symbols and symbolism and speaking in symbols. That's the nature of mystery, Babylon the Great. Paul said that when we present the gospel, we use great plainness of speech. Mystery Babylon the Great doesn't know how to say anything plainly. She speaks in riddles and enigmas wrapped up in mysteries and and everything's everything is it says one thing but it means another that's mystery babylon the great so she's like the queen of symbolism and here you see katy perry coming out as she's and she's wearing her fire dress and that's the lyrics she's dancing through the fire and then of course she sings baby you're a firework and i talked about that I don't know, about a year or so ago I never, I've heard the song, you know, you go into these convenience stores and they're playing the song and I'm going, I don't know who that is. And then somebody pointed me out to it and I'll tell you, I'll tell you how they got my attention. They said, Pastor, you ought to see this Katy Perry video. It's got two guys on there kissing one another. And I'm going, okay, I'm going to take a look at this and I'm watching it and I'm going, wait a minute. I mean, I see that, but there's something more here about, you know, I just had a thought. Oh, I wish I'd have got this now. Um, maybe somebody can do this. Maybe somebody can do this. Okay? I'm going to give you a heads up. Anybody who can send me a graphic, a screen capture, of in Katy Perry's video of uh, You're a Firework, there is this lady on a, on a um, doctor's table, and she's travailing in birth. <laughs> it's <laughs> she's <laughs> she's got sparks shooting out of her tush okay i'm just telling you what's coming out the whole, and if you can get a screen capture of that for me and email it pastormikeonline at gmail.com i will give you a free video download from youtube all right courtesy of prophetic research ministry uh, so, but anyway, the whole song, the firework, is about the divine spark, which is the Jewish Kabbalah, mysticism. It's the the mystery religion, and um, she ends. Let me get to this other graphic here. She ends the concert like this. Here is a pentagram. Falling from heaven. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground which didst weaken the nations? Thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. This, this star picks her up and carries her upward. I will be like the Most High. 
All this while Katy Perry is singing about the secret doctrine of the divine spark. It basically says that there is a piece of divinity or a divine God in everybody. You've got God on the inside. It doesn't matter if you're a Buddhist or a Muslim or, or if you're a Rick Warren uh, uh, or an infidel. It doesn't matter. You have this divine spark inside of you. And it needs a ritual to bring it out to a full flame of divinity. This is the language that they use. And so she's singing this song, and her God, the falling star, has picked her up, and she's flying above the heights of the clouds. And that's what you get out of it. Um, but it's the language of symbolism that you're watching this, that if you know the Bible, and a lot of you are going, oh, I get that. Uh, I was reading just random comments on Facebook Sunday night. Uh, again, I was just watching the game, but I was going through to see what everybody's saying. And somebody's going, oh, there's a there's a checkerboard floor there, black and white tiles, just like in the Masonic Lodge. I'm going, oh, wow, cool. I have to look at that. And sure enough, there is. You educate yourself a little bit on the meaning of these symbols. And when you see it, you just, you don't, you don't go. You mean... Katy Perry's in the Illuminati? <gasps> I would have never known that. You don't you don't do that. You're going. Yeah, okay, here's a woman riding in on a beast. Yeah, there's a checkerboard floor. Yeah, she's uh, she's dressed got fire all over her and she's flying through space because of the falling star with five points on it. Okay, I got that. Let's move on to the third quarter. Um, anyway, if you're able to send that screen capture to me, I would mucho appreciado it. Oh, all right. Now, here is something my um, son-in-law, Mick, and my daughter, Alicia, are headed to Kenya once again. He sent me this the other day, and I didn't see it. Those of you out in Kenya listening, KBTR, Watchman FM, 91.3, I want you to hear this. When I came to Kenya the first time in 2011, it was out, it was out in western Kenya. We was in Katali, and then we were in um, Rongo. And I told everybody out there, don't believe every wind of doctrine that comes from America. Don't believe me simply because I'm a Mzungu preacher from America and you think I'm successful. In fact, the pastors, several pastors were talking to me um, on a Sunday morning, Sunday afternoon in um, Kibera, the slum of Nairobi. Pastor, what is the secret to your success? And I'm just going, I'm successful? Really? But I knew what they were getting at, and I said, failure. And they went, what? I said, yeah, lots of failure. The bigger I've failed, the better God has been in my life. Um, just because it's a church, that doesn't mean that it's right and that they're preaching right. And I want all you good folks in Kenya to hear me out. Because this issue came up the first time I was in Kenya. It came up again this last August with Pastor Mike Hutzel and Brent Hutzel and myself. We were in attendance at a meeting. And the head of this meeting not only had his wife ordained, but he was in support of... Um, they had three tents, four tents set up, and we were preaching in the middle area. And they had one tent reserved for the singers and 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 Pastor Hutzel and Pastor Hutzel and myself, and then all of the other pastors, bishops of churches, were in this one tent sitting together. And they were asked to come wherever they were from and sit in this one tent. Well, there was a couple of ladies that came. They're, they weren't pastors' wives per se. They were in there because they were told that they were pastors. They were ordained as pastors. And 
Brother Mike Hutzel and Brent and I, we prayed about it. And we agreed this is an issue that we're going to have to deal with, and we did. We dealt with it from, from the biblical viewpoint alone. We didn't say, well, our tradition says this, and, you know, this is how the whites do it. This is how the Mzungus do it. We didn't say it like that. What we said was, this is how the Bible says for it to be done. And so I want you to, I want you to keep that in mind. It's not, re, it's not allowed in the scripture for a woman to be a bishop of a church or a pastor of a church or an elder or a deacon. It is permitted for women to prophesy. The sons and the daughters prophesy. I believe that. And there is a place where that can be done. But for a woman to stand up and usurp the authority of either her husband or other men in that church is not permitted in Scripture. Go read 1 Corinthians 14. And by the way, they're not even allowed to come and speak in tongues openly in the church service. They are to be silent in the church. You get mad at me if you want to. I'm just the mailman. I'm just the guy bringing you the letter that Paul wrote. You don't like it. Take it up with Paul and the Holy Ghost. But I want you to listen to this. This is from a church in Nairobi. Um, Pastor Kathy Kiuna. Now, that's, that's the first thing wrong with this right here. Pastor Kathy. See, it's not, it just, it's not right. Pastor Kathy Kiuna warns, listen to this now, warns poor people don't attend her church sermons. I'll read you what she said. Pastor Alan Kiuna, that's right. Pastor Alan Kiuna of JCC, I don't know what that is, I don't know what church that is, has shocked the world by agreeing to what his flashy wife, Pastor Kathy Kiuna, just did. The lady, a pastor at the church, recently bashed at poor Kenyans against attending her church services during a sermon dubbed Digging Deeper. You know what that means? Dig deeper in your pockets and pull out more money for us. Here is Pastor Kathy's quote. This is not a place for poor people. If you can't tithe, find another church. We don't entertain poverty. There are many churches in Nairobi which accommodate poor people, but JCC is not one of them. Unquote. She told worshipers who cheered her on, shouting, Preach it, Mom! It is clear that Kathy hates poor people with a passion, despite having grown up in the slums. I've been to those slums. Preached in them. Just recently, she insulted Eastlanders. That's an area east of Nairobi. By calling them poor and lazy, she further advised ladies from Eastlands to rent servants' quarters in posh estates so that they can find rich men to marry them. Despite having received a backlash from Eastlands residents on social media, she refused to apologize and put it clear that she has no time for idlers. She actually said, if you are poor and you cannot tithe, don't come in our church. You see, there's a reason why the devil didn't go to Adam first. He went to Eve. And you say, well, that's mean you're saying that. No, that's what Paul said. Paul said the serpent, he didn't go to Adam. Who did he deceive? Eve. She was the weaker vessel. And Paul knew it. So here's this woman. And her, of course her husband agrees. Let's see, where can I find? 
Uh, where is it? Where is it? I've got a sound effect. Here we go. Of course her husband agrees. You got a problem with what I say? No, dear. No, you go ahead and say that. It's okay with me. You better say it, boy. Kenya, you need revival just like America does. Um, and, again, I love you. But if things aren't right, if it's not right in America, it's not right in Kenya. And if the Bible says this is how it has to be, then it has to be that way in America, in Kenya, in South Africa, in France. Oh, my goodness, France needs it bad. But that's how it has to be. All right. Uh, oh, I got a screenshot here. Oh, yeah, there you go. Let me uh, let me do this, and let me do that, and let me do that. There it is. Voila! Thank you, Brian. You get a free video download from YouTube. Okay. Now, listen to this. This is what I tweeted. Ministers of Parliament, this is from the UK, Ministers of Parliament say yes to three-person babies. And you're going, well, you know, I knew the world was getting pretty nasty, but I don't see how that works. It's not, it doesn't work naturally. God designed nature. He designed it. It's got flaws in it, but God built that into it. We are a shadow of things to come. But God is the one who designed everything in this world, including babies being born. Therefore, I'll just quote scripture, Genesis chapter 2. Therefore, shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. And it means exactly what it says. Because some people, they, they don't believe that. They say, well, it doesn't literally mean that they're, the two are one. It doesn't mean that. It's a spiritual unity thing that they, that they become. But it doesn't really mean that they're one. Well, yeah, it does. Of course it does. God said it. But if you take it then and apply it to the union of a man and a woman, they literally are combining their genetics, and the child that is born is one of both of them. One flesh. That Bible's right. It is absolutely dead on right. But now... And this is how it's been now for thousands of years. On this planet, it's been this way, that you have a mummy and you have a daddy, and that's it. You might have a godparent. You need to protect the family. Or you might have, uh, you might have been raised by your grandparents, or, your aunt, or you might have been raised by a village, or whatever. But genetically, biologically, and legally, a child has a father and a mother. On birth certificates, all you, all you people out in Kenya, on Barack Obama's Kenyan birth certificate, he is listed as having a father and a mother. And there is no space for other on there. It's just father and mother. That would be, if we had Barack Obama's Kenyan birth certificate, that's what we would have. We would have a father and a mother. My birth certificate has a father and a mother on it. It does not have a father, a mother, a significant other, a friend of the family, a genetic donor from California. doesn't have anything like that. But now, now that it's possible to create in a laboratory... A child with three or more genetic donors. Now that it's possible. I've been talking about this for several years. Since I first heard about it, I'm going, 
they're going to have to change everything. They're going to have to rewrite laws, contracts, um, the legal precedents, and the legal standings of certain issues. I don't think that we can even conceive in our mind how much of a transformation is going to occur all over the world simply because we are now allowing three parent babies. But here's the article. In a historic move, ministers of parliament have, fa have voted in favor of the creation of babies with DNA from two women and one man. The UK is now set to become the first country to introduce laws to allow the creation of babies from three people. In a free vote in the House of Commons, 382 MPs were in favor and 128 against the technique that stops genetic diseases from being passed from mother to child. You see, it's all about making everybody gods. That's what this is about. It's about making them immortals. Why? Why, if we could do this, then we could fight disease and, and we could cure cancer and then people would live forever. Let me tell you something. There's what, over 7 billion people on this planet? What, um, and, and you're saying that you're going to let people live forever and not die? What's that going to do to the population rate of planet Earth? Because we're pretty much dependent on people dying as people are being born and we know that there's more people being born than there are people dying you can blame the muslims for that but that's just sort of how the how the universe and the world is balanced out they want people to they they want to sell it to you that you could this could eliminate disease in your child during the debate, ministers said the technique was, quote, light at the end of a dark tunnel for families. The proponent said the backing was good news for progressive medicine. The chief medical officer, Professor Dame Sally Davies, what a dame she is, man, what a dame. Dame Sally Davies, in case you don't know what that is, she is the female recipient of knighthood, okay? Professor Dame Sally Davies said a yes vote would put the U.K. at the forefront of scientific development. A further vote is required in the House of Lords. If everything goes uh, ahead, then the first such baby could be born next year. Critics say they will continue to fight against the technique that they say raises too many ethical and safety concerns. But it's a life, it's going to save lives. Why don't you want this? The technique which was developed in Newcastle should help women like Sharon Bernardi from Sunderland who lost all seven of her children to mitochondrial disease. Mitochondria are the tiny compartments inside nearly every cell of the body that convert food into usable energy. That Think of the altars in the tabernacle. The, burnt, the altar of burnt offering in the tabernacle. That's what, that, that's what mitochondria is. Mitochondria takes in they're, the, they're like the Levite priests. They take in uh, sugar from the bloodstream unless you have diabetes. And if you have diabetes, if you have type 2 diabetes, then your Levite priests are like Hophni and Phineas. They're lazy. They're sitting out there not doing anything. They won't take in the sacrifices. Okay? That's what's wrong with me. I've got Hophni's and Phineas's in there, and they're too lazy to open up the doorway to my cells and take the sugar and put it in there. That's what insulin does. Uh, but anyway, defective mitochondria, which are passed down only from the mother, lead to brain damage, muscle wasting, heart failure, and blindness. I knew, I knew my kid's brain damage was because of my wife. I knew that. It results in babies with 0.1% of their DNA from the second woman and is a permanent change that would be passed down through the generations. Did you catch that? It's a permanent change. From this point forward, this child will pass on three-parent DNA to its children. 
I just fathom this. We have we have just permitted in the UK. We have just permitted genetic alteration of our species. And we have set a course for this world that will fundamentally transform and change every living human being on the planet. You, th you think, well, you're kind of making a big deal about this one, aren't you? No, they're the ones who make this a big deal. Because let, let's let's go to this. I want you to take your Bible, turn to Matthew 24, and I want you to hold that place there. Because just before I started talking today, I was looking at that chapter and I saw two verses and I went, oh, I think I know what that means. It's related to this. In our Bibles, in Psalm 139. We're told that our DNA is a book that God wrote. In thy book, all my members were written, which in continuance was fashioned, when as yet there was none of them. I started making notes. Um, I had the idea. I've, I've, I've done this study several times of just the word book or books in the King James Bible. It's an it's, it's amazing study. 196 times in your King James Bible, which is uh, 70, no, let's see, let me get this right. It's uh, 49 times 2. There we go. 7 times 7 times 2. Multiples of 7. Perfection, completion. By the way, 196 times the word book or books. The name Jesus Christ, 196 times, exactly the same amount. 7 times 7 times 2. Son of Man, exactly, 196 times, 7 times 7 times 2. Download the Pure Bible Search software, do that, okay? You'll like it, I promise you, you'll like it. But just studying the word book, I, I was making notes, I had this idea, and I just started chasing it down. The word book in the King James Bible has numerous applications. God, of course, had a book in his right hand, sealed with seven seals. There's the number seven there, perfection and completion, it's it's in order, and then I, I was thinking, well, if God called in Psalm 139, if he called our DNA scroll a book, then it would be interesting to go through the Bible and, and think of DNA when we see the word book. It's easy when you open up to Genesis 5, and the first occurrence of the word book you find in the Bible is in Genesis 5.1. It says, this is the book of the generations of Adam. And you take that now and you, th you apply the, the idea of a book being uh, DNA. When you look at Genesis 5.1, the, the book of DNA is, th this is the DNA of Adam and his generations, his genetics. Whatever, however God wrote Adam's DNA, at that point, Adam then passed that down through all the successive of. Uh, genealogies down from his life on down to us I am a son of Adam and I have my father's DNA I have Adam's DNA in me and so that's what generations represent uh, the first New Testament occurrence of the word book is in Matthew 1 1 the book of the generation of Jesus Christ it's the book of his DNA and so you just you can run through this in the Bible and, and look at all the places where the word book is, and then just kind of picture that as DNA. And I think you'll like what you see. Like I say, I started on that study. I, I didn't finish it. It's like a lot of other stuff that I do, uh, but it's an, on, it's an ongoing thing. Now, here's, here's to me, this is so cool. Here is God saying, or Jesus saying, of course, Jesus is God. Here is Jesus saying, at the end of the book, that if any man adds to the words of the prophecy of this book, I will add unto him the plagues that are written therein. If any man will take away from the words of this book, I will take his name out of the book of life. So here is what 
the United Kingdom Parliament, the land of the King James Bible. Here's what they agreed on and approved. They agreed to circumvent the final authority of God as the author of man's DNA. They decided to cancel his copyright. And they're now going to legally break the law that Jesus set forth by taking a newly conceived child, removing what they refer to as bad DNA. It's bad DNA. Bad. You went on the carpet, you bad DNA, by taking bad DNA out and putting a third party's DNA in there. Are, did you catch this? Daniel chapter 2. We are learning how to do what is in Daniel. I can't even get to Daniel quick enough. Daniel chapter 2, Nebuchadnezzar's dream. The gold, the silver, the brass, the iron, the iron mixed with clay that's mingled together. What does it mean? They shall mingle themselves with the seed of men. Do you understand what this means? It means that they're going to add a third party as a parent to man's two-party parent DNA. That's what that means. And the United Kingdom's parliament just approved it and sent it on to the lords, the house of the lords. They sent it over there. I don't know if they're going to approve it or not, but this thing has been talked about for years. If they don't approve it this week, it'll be, I guarantee you, it'll be next year. And then it'll be in America. Then it'll be in India and China and every place in the world. All of a sudden now, we're curing human diseases. How are we doing that? We're adding different people's DNA to this child. So now he has more than one set of parents. He's got three or four or five or six or seven or however many they can do that. But they are, we are, as a, as a people right now, we are fulfilling where Daniel chapter 2 is taking this world. It is happening right in front of your very eyes. And I, I want to I say something kind of mean and cruel, and I, I, but I, I'm fighting myself. I will say that we are seeing this right in front of our very eyes. We're seeing the road that leads to the fulfillment of Daniel chapter 2, but we're sitting fighting over this trib and that trib and that pre and that post and that we're, we're kind of fighting amongst ourselves over this stuff. I have it as the, my, in my heart and in my mind and in my spirit that this immensely more information in it than any scholar has ever grasped in life. I'm going to ask yourself the question, what did Clarence Larkin know about DNA? What did he know about it? Nothing. And am I saying Clarence Larkin's doctor is bad because he didn't have DNA? No. Because he didn't know about it? No. What I'm saying is we're seeing things with our eyes right now that when we look in this Bible, we go, there it is right there. There it is right there. This, this is that which was spoken. Now I'm going to show you something from, um, and I, I, I don't know if I was going to read the rest of the article or not. Um, here, is, here is one minister of parliament who voted against it, Fiona Bruce, she said, this will be passed down generations, the implications of this simply cannot be predicted. And she's right. Here we are playing God with mosquitoes. We're genetically altering mosquitoes, and then we're releasing them out into the world, into the wild. We, we don't have the first clue as to what's going to happen 10, 20 years from now. I mean, you saw um, 
Will Smith, what was it? Fighting the vampire zombies. Uh, I am uh, I am legend. Uh, I read the book that that movie was supposedly based on. It was very loosely based upon the book. You know what? It was it, it had an agenda. Man alters DNA. He's going to cure cancer, but now all of a sudden we've turned him into zombies. Take your Bible, turn to Matthew 24. I want you to think about something. Right now, your DNA and my DNA are essentially the same. We descend from our father, Adam, and our mother, Eve. If you don't believe that, I'm sorry, but she was called Eve for what reason? She was the mother of all living. That's why they called her Eve. Everybody that's alive right now, and I'll just throw this in just because, that just sort of, that just sort of kills your gap theory. Um, I've, and they're different ones, and I, I understand that. But a lot of gap theorists say that the Cro-Magnon man and the Neanderthal man, they were all... The, they were really humanoids, and they were the precursors and so on. Man And Adam was not the first, quote-unquote, human on the planet. That there were countless others out there, but he's the first one that God made a covenant with. Which breaks, I don't know how many scriptures, because by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin. If there were other people other than Adam then none of them could have ever died. Adam was the first one. But anyway, you and I are the recipients of Adam's DNA. We have been produced. Let's think about what was said in, in Genesis 5. This is the book of the generations, plural, of Adam. And then when you look in Genesis 10, and you see all those families, 72 of them, when you see all of those families there in Genesis chapter 10, every one of them came from Adam. Every single one of them came from Adam and Eve. Then they came from Noah and his wife, and then through their sons and their wives. And no, I do not believe for a second that any of Noah's uh, daughter-in-laws or any of the wives of the three men that were on the ark had Nephilim bloodline in it. That's what some people say. That's how they they, they survived the flood, and now the and now it's it's the it's the people of Ham. You know what you're saying, don't you? You're saying exactly what the Ku Klux Klan and the skinheads and the white supremacists and the Christian identity people, the British Israel people. This is what they teach. They teach that blacks, Latinos, um, uh, Easterners. They're all of the seed of Ham, and Ham's wife was probably a giant, and she passed on that corrupted bloodline, and none of these people are real humans, therefore we can hate them, because they're not real humans. That, that's, what that, that's what that's for. That's where that doctrine comes from. And it's not in the Bible. It doesn't exist anywhere. Noah was perfect in his generations. He handed that down to Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They married three wives, one apiece. And every human being in the world is a recipient of Adam's generations, either through Ham, Japheth, or Shem, through Moses, through Lamech, all the way back to Adam. Now, I'm saying all that for a reason. I want you to look in Matthew chapter 24, verse 32. Let's, let's draw a circle around where I'm, where I'm going. I just was looking at this an hour ago, and I saw a connection between two verses that I've never seen before, but it makes a lot of sense. It says, Now learn a parable of the fig tree. When his branch is yet tender, and putteth forth leaves, ye know that summer is nigh. So likewise, when ye shall see all these things, know that it is near, even at the doors. Now, 
verse 34 is a, a passage of Scripture that a lot of people have done a lot of calculations with. They've gotten their calculators out and their Bibles and their genealogy charts and they're calculating this and they're adding this up and they're they're taking away this and they're putting dates here and they're, they're you know what the, and you know what these you know what they're trying to do trying to figure out the year of the Lord's return that's what they're trying to figure out because it says verily I say unto you this generation shall not pass till all these things be fulfilled. Look at the next verse. Heaven and earth shall pass away, or shall pass. Uh, let me hear. Okay, here's verse 35. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. Now watch this. Generations, we know has to do with the book of generations, which is DNA, which is the words of the book. Jesus said, heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. Did you catch that? I think there is a connection between verse 34 and verse 35. I don't think that the reference to this generation in verse 34, I don't think it has anything to do with a time frame. And I think I mentioned this Sunday night. There were some people that, that took the gathering of Israel, 1948, and then a generation is 40 years and so that should be 1988. And they were... Yeah, we missed it. Yeah, we missed it. All right. Okay. All right. Here, here's We know where we went wrong. I mean, obviously, a generation is not 40 years. A generation must be 70 years. That puts it at 2018. I can't say for sure. I can't say uh, how wrong that idea is. But... I, I'm not looking for 2018 to be the year. I'm not. Because people said that 2012 was going to be the year after they realized they were wrong that 2001 should have been the year. And then it was supposed to be 1999 that was supposed to be the year. And then it was supposed to be 1988 that was supposed to be the year. And then it was supposed to be 1980. And then it was, you see what I'm getting at. Every year that everybody has ever picked to be the year that the Lord's going to come back, of course, they've all been wrong every time. And that's the kind of stuff that you expect out of the Jehovah's Witness and the Herald camping crowd. That's the kind of stuff you expect from them. And I'm going to be dead honest with you. I, God took me out of worrying about the day and the hour Years ago, at the very beginning of God showing me things from the Bible, I was looking, I just went right to the front, and I'm going to go, I'm going to find the day and the hour before anybody else does. And I'm going to write a book about it, and I'm going to sell it. And, and God yanked my shirt collar and said, no, you're not. Mike, don't do that. So I don't. I don't sit around and try to calculate out how it's going to play out. It, it's, it's, I, had, I had people calling me last year saying that it was going to be last year. And they knew it. And they were wrong. I don't think the word generation here has anything to do with a time frame. I think it has everything to do with the words of a book. The words of the book that God wrote. That Jesus, I mean, look at, look at, let's read verse 34 and 35 together. Verily I say unto you, this generation shall not pass till all these things be fulfilled. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. 
is it just me or does it look like Jesus is is putting generations along with his words that will not pass away? That's what it looks like to me. Read it again. Verily I say unto you, this generation shall not pass till all these things be fulfilled. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. So in these two verses, he says the generation will not pass and my words will not pass. And think, I, think they're, I think they're together. I think none shall want her mate. I think one implies the other. I think the word generation has very little to do with 40 years or 46 years or 70 years or 77 years or 90. I, I think it has very little to do with that. I think it has everything to do with the genetic structure of how God designed human beings, the generations of Adam, and then the generation of Jesus Christ. Um, even in the Old Testament, let me pull this up, in the book of Psalms, I just, uh, oh, I already, already, <laughs> already had that word up. I'll tell you, if you want a good word study, uh, study the word seed. Yeah, here it is, Psalm 2230. Look there in your Bible. Psalm 22:30 what does it say a All right that was a little weird My Windows computer just uh hold it you lost my face You need my face hang on here there we are. That was weird. When I'm running, um, it's a thing with Wirecast, when I'm running the dual monitor thing with Wirecast, Windows um, has a little fit, and it tries to change the scheme, the, the display and stuff like that, and that's what happened. Man, I was on a roll, too. Psalm 22, verse 30. A seed shall serve him. Seed is DNA. A seed shall serve him, and it shall be accounted to the Lord for a what? A generation. If you're looking in the Bible to find out what a generation means, in the Bible it means a seed. A DNA strand, a bloodline, a lineage, generations. We are of the generation of Adam. We have been generated by Adam. We are the recipients of his DNA and Eve's. So I th here's, here's what I think. I think that there is going to be a fundamental, foundational transformation of human beings in the very near future. And we've already heard from the scientist in the UK that once that third-party genetic donation takes place, it will always be there through successive generations. So I want you to think of, think of it like this. Um, here is here is daddy and here is mommy. Daddy received his DNA from his mom and dad. Mommy received her DNA from her mom and dad. Their generation was the same as the generations of Adam. The two shall become one flesh. That's how God said it in Genesis 2. That generation is going to give place to Let's see, this generation. Because this generation, although 
this child had a dual donor father and a dual donor mother. This child has a triple helix donor. Does it make sense to everybody? This child is this generation stops with this child. Did you catch that? This generation ends right here. From this point forward, every successive generation from the, the triple helix guy here, every successive generation from him bears no resemblance to these. These are the old ways. That's how we used to do it with kids. Now we've got three or four or five or six donors inside one child. You see what I'm saying here? This generation is not going to pass until all these things be fulfilled. I'll give you something just give you something to think about. Something and I'm I'm trying not to be mean here, something besides waiting and looking at every news article from Israel looking for a seven-year peace treaty. Because that's what everybody said. Well, it's going to be a seven-year peace treaty. That's when we're going to be raptured. So we always watch for a seven-year peace treaty with Israel. There's been, I don't know, probably 50 of them in the last 50 years. Just That was an exaggerated guess. How many peace deals have been made with Israel? When Jimmy Carter got Menachem Bacon, my dad used to call him Ham Hocks and Bacon. <laughs> Menachem Bacon. When Jimmy Carter got Ham Hocks and Bacon together with uh, Anwar Sadat and they signed a peace agreement, everybody's going to peace agreement with Israel. That's just start the rapture. And it didn't happen. Bill Clinton, George Bush. Not so much Barack Obama. He's not getting a peace deal with anything with Netanyahu, I guarantee you. But they're all looking, everybody's looking for a peace treaty with Israel. Let's just kind of put that to the side and let's look at some other things because there's a lot here. Get your Bible out. Uh, let me see a couple of emails here. Glenn says, Pastor, that makes a lot of sense. That nasty, no good, three strand DNA generation shall not pass or carry on and destroy the planet. Um, David said, Pastor, my doctor ordered blood work. Uh, the test said I had an imbalance. They gave me a DNA card to carry and want to give synthetic shots and vitamins. What should I do? I, David, I can't tell you what to do. I'm not a doctor, and I mean that. I don't, and I'll just say to everybody out there, don't ask me medical advice. Don't ask me to give medical advice because I'm not a doctor, and I, wouldn't, I, I would take on a liability on myself of giving out medical advice, and I am not a doctor, I'm not, not your doctor. The only thing, David, that I can tell you to do is do what your doctor said. Okay? I don't, and I'll say this again, I don't think there's anything in the world right now that is going to alter your DNA and change you into a beast without you knowing about it. Okay? I don't think it's that underhanded. I really don't. Uh, let's see here. Pastor Mike, do you think that three-strand DNA babies will have a soul? Uh, mm. Next question. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. It's like asking if, um, if, um, Cloned babies will have a soul. I don't know. Anyway, get your Bibles out. Turn to Matthew chapter 24. All right? Let's look at something. And we're going to start it in verse 1. Jesus went out and departed from the temple. Underline that in your Bible. You know Why? Because Jesus departed from the temple. Why does the Bible say that? Why is the Bible using that particular language? 
Why doesn't it say, I was strolling in the park one day in the merry, merry month of May? It doesn't say that. He said, Jesus went out and departed from the temple. What That temple represented the body of Israel at that time. Oh, wow. I just, I just got something else, too. Wow! He departed from the temple. I want you to, I want you, you can write this down. You don't have to write this in your Bible. But I want you to write this word, Matthew 24, 1, and Jesus went out and departed from the temple. Write the word, Ichabod. Ichabod. Because you know what Ichabod stands for? The glory is departed. Dun, dun, dun! Jesus is the glory of the Lord. He is. That's who he is. The glory just departed. Ladies and gentlemen, Jesus has left the temple. To me, that is profound. Right there in Matthew 24. And I'm just, and again, I'm just telling you, there's more things in the Bible to look at other than a seven year peace treaty with Israel. There's more here. Go look at it. Jesus went out and departed from the temple. And his disciples came to, to him for to show him the buildings, plural, of the temple. Jesus said unto them, See not all these things? Verily I say unto you, There shall not be left here one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. Verse 3, As he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us when shall these things be, and what shall be the sign of thy coming, and of the end of the world? Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. And ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars, See that ye be not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. Now, we talked about that last Thor's day, what nation versus nation, kingdom versus kingdom, spy versus spy, if you've ever read Mad Magazine, what nation against nation, I think, represents. I think it represents a, a seed, a type of bloodline or a, or a, or a family or a kind or a kindred, uh, an ethnic group. In this case, I think that this nation, one of the nations referred to here is the nation that comes from the North Country. And some of you are going, oh, no, not Canada. Yeah. No, farther north than Canada. I think if you study what comes out of the north in Jeremiah, in Joel, you'll see what comes out of the north. It's, a, it's an army that has teeth like lions, that they have the appearance of horses. They're like locusts. And they have tattoos all over their body like Todd Bentley. Um, that's, that's Revelation chapter 9. That's who that nation is. That's who that is. Nation shall rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. And there shall be famines and pestilences and earthquakes in diverse places. And then he says, verse 8 here is what we're going to focus on. All these are the beginning of... I've underlined that word sorrows, as in George sorrows. Um, and do your own study 
of the word. Let's see how many times it is. Let's pull up the King James Pure Bible Search software. You know what? Let me put this on screen here. That way you'd get to see it, all right? Let's uh, sweep it with the besom of destruction, and let's type in S-O-R-R-O-W with an asterisk and hit what happened? Oh, I didn't put it in there. Here we go. S no S O R R O W asterisk and hit enter. A hundred and fifteen times that word is used in the King James Bible. Oh look, the very first occurrence. Genesis chapter three. And guess what it has um guess what it talks about? Unto the woman, he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. In sorrow thou shalt bring forth, what? Children. And thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. Now, I did not have that verse in my notes for today. I'm glad I looked it up. Because the first place you find the word sorrow or sorrows or whatever in your Bible is in, is in direct relation to a baby being born, giving birth to a new generation, as it were. Are you following me on this? This is cool now. Is Matthew 24, all these are the beginning of sorrows, is Matthew 24 and the sorrows, are they... Are a, are they a representation or do they do they define like a woman in a travail? Is it that kind of sorrow? I think it is. I think it is. I think what I see here in Genesis three, how the word sorrow is used. It's used in conception and in bringing forth children. And any of you women that have had a child, you know. The sorrow of being in childbirth. And it's like, oh, I am so sorry I ever agreed to have this kid. Okay? Then you hug it for a while and it's cute while it's a baby. Then it, all of a sudden it goes from being six months old to 15 and a half years old. And you're going, I'm sorry I ever carried that thing in nine months in my body. That's a... Okay. Anyway, sorrows. I want you to think of, and we're going to go through some scriptures here. I want you to think of stories in the Bible about a woman having a baby. I want you to think of Jesus departing from the temple. All right? Just, just kind of ponder that. I want you to think of nation against nation. What was, what was in um, Rebecca's womb? A nation fighting another nation in her womb. They were fighting. Mark 13, 8 is the parallel. It's the complementary passage. Hi, Matthew. You look really good. Well, thank you, Mark. You look nice, too. See, they're complementary to one another. Mark 13, 8, for nation shall rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be earthquakes in divers places. So wherever there, wherever you can dive, there's going to be an earthquake there. Okay, uh, And there shall be famines and troubles. These are the beginnings of sorrows. Is it related to birthing a child? Yes, I think it is. Now we go to John chapter 16. Look at verse 20, John 16, 20. Verily, verily, I say unto you, which to me is interesting, um, the language of the King James Bible, you, you all know that thee and thou are um, second person singular. Is it, did I say that right? Yeah, second person singular. He didn't say, verily, verily, I say unto thee, as he's speaking to one person. He's saying you. He's speaking to how many people? Mark says, what I say unto you, I say unto all. So that tells me right there, all means all, and that's all all means is all. 
Um, John 16, 20, he says it again. Verily, verily, I say unto you, it is a say unto thee, he says, I say unto you, that ye shall weep and lament, but the world shall rejoice, and ye shall be sorrowful, but your sorrow shall be turned into joy. A woman, when she is in travail, hath sorrow. There's a double witness right there. Because her hour is come. But as soon as she is delivered of the child, she remembereth no more the anguish for joy that a man is born into the world. Wow. And ye now therefore have sorrow, but I will see you again, and your heart shall rejoice, and your joy no man taketh from you. Now, uh, here's, here's, what I th- here's what I think we could, as we're looking at Matthew 24, Mark 13, Luke 21. Looking at these verses and, and the things that are going on here, nation and against nation and pestilences and famines and earthquakes, these are the beginnings of the labor period. It's the beginning of when a child is going to be born. We're, we are due for our next new grandbaby. I can't wait. As much as I want her to come, it's going to be a girl, as much as I want her to come, Lindsay wants it that much more times a billion because she's tired and she's big. And I make her slave over here every day editing videos. She is, she's not in labor right now. So there's no need to go to the hospital. There's no need to call for a midwife. There's no need to get an ambulance over here. We don't need to boil some water. Hurry, boil some water. I never could figure that out on TV every time somebody's going to have a baby. We need to boil some water. Are you going to dip the baby in there or what? Good grief. That's. Um, but at some point, those pains are going to kick in and they're going to start out kind of a mild pain at first, every few minutes, and then the pain increases and the time between it becomes shorter. And then the pain increases more and more and more and more until it's nearly unbearable. And I thank God every day that he never made men have babies. We'd, we wouldn't do it. We wouldn't do it. We'd all die off. We'd have died off thousands of years ago. No way in the world. But you ladies, you remember the going through the pain, the screaming, agonizing pain. But then what? It's over with. The child has been born. You hear it crying, and you reach out for your new baby, and you hold it up next to you, and you look at his eyes and his little fingers and his little toes, and you're looking it over him real good, and you're wiping everything off, and you're going, this baby is beautiful. This baby is awesome. Where's the screaming? Where's the kicking? Where's the, the hateful remarks to your husband that you made? They're all gone. It's all been forgotten now because now the baby's born. And, you know, I've had some people who they, they, they think that anybody with anything other than a pre-trib idea they think that we're nuts because, the, and they use this expression, what? You think Jesus would take his bride and drag her through all that stuff before he marries her? What kind of husband is that? I mean, that's the logic that they use. Now, aside from, like, all the places in the New Testament where it talks about us suffering along with Christ as his bride, but they're missing the point. It's not the prenuptial dragging the bride through the warfare and the famines and all that stuff. It doesn't have anything to do with that. It has everything to do with having a baby, bringing forth a man-child. 
Think of the sorrows. All the, he said all these are the beginning of sorrows. Now, there's two babies we're going to talk about. Two of them that I think are going to be birthed, or the idea or the symbolism of that. And I want you to picture this. Job 15, 20. The wicked man travaileth with pain all his days, and the number of years is hidden to the oppressor. The wicked man travaileth with pain all his days. Do you think of travail and sorrow and what it represents? Psalm 711, God judgeth the righteous. God is angry with the wicked every day. If he turn not, he will wet his sword. He hath bent his bow and made it ready. He hath also prepared for him the instruments of death. He ordaineth his arrows against the persecutors. Behold, he travaileth with iniquity. Wow. I want you to think about two, two men child being born. Two babies. One of them represents Antichrist. One of them represents Christ. Here we have travailing with iniquity in Psalm 7, 14. And listen to this whole verse. Psalm 7, 14, Behold, he travaileth with iniquity, and hath conceived mischief, and brought forth falsehood. Did you see that? Every part of verse 14 details the bringing forth of a child from conception through the travail to the birth. The conception, he hath conceived mischief. The travailing is travailing with iniquity. The child that's brought forth is falsehood. Think of what James said. Let me... Um, let me look this up here so I can get it right. Oh, I know how to do this. If you're using your search software, type in the phrase, it is finished. It is finished. And you're going, oh, well, okay, that's when Jesus was on the cross, right? Yep. There's two places in the whole Bible where that phrase, it is finished, is used in the King James Bible. I used to hear, I used to hear this saying when I was young growing up in church. You know where Jesus said, it is finished when he's on the cross? They must have got this from Perry the Stone. According to rabbinical traditions, according to the ancient Hebrew traditions, when the high priest every year on the, on the Feast of, 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 of Trumpets and the, and the Day of Atonement, when the high priest would go into the tabernacle and, 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 and sprinkle the blood seven times on the mercy seat, once he was done with his, uh, with his Levitical duties, he would come back out and he would raise his hands to the sky and proclaim to the nation of Israel, it is accomplished. And I believed it for a long time. And I'm going, oh, wow, you know, okay, I kind of get that. Okay, you know, the sacrifice and the blood and here's Christ and everything. And then I decided to look for that. You ever look for it? It ain't there. It's not in your Bible. There's no place. There's no place in the Bible where you see the high priest coming out cleaning his hands, getting blood off of him and saying, it's accomplished. That It's not there. You look at the verse, John 19, 30, when Jesus therefore had received the vinegar, he said, it is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up the ghost. Look at what he said and then look at what happened. He said, it is finished. He bowed his head and gave up the ghost. Now look at James 1, 15. It's the only other place in the whole King James Bible where the phrase, it is finished, is used. And I remember one day looking, I'm going, okay, God, where is that? And I just typed in, it is finished. And when I saw it, I wept. I wept. James 1, 15. Then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin. Sin when it is finished bringeth forth death Christ became sin for us who knew no sin and he said it is finished and he died 
and James 1.15 was not written before John 19.30. It was written after. James, by inspiration of the Holy Ghost of God, said this, and however it's said in Greek, 1,600 years later, translators sat down. All, 50, all 54 of them agreed it should say it is finished. It is finished, and it brought forth death. Aside, I just, to, to me, this King James Version Bible has stuff in it like that. You can cling to those other translations all you want to. I'll hang on to my King James because it's got stuff like that in it. But look at James 1.15 for what it says. Lust hath conceived. There's a conception again. And just, I'm going to try to keep this birds and bees G-rated. We use the word conceive in thought processes. You have preconceived notions of how you think I am or what you think I believe in or whatever. Or if you have a good idea, you are said to have conceived this good idea in your mind. And then you've got to let it develop for a while. And then you're ready to share it with the world and show everybody what, you're, you, know, what you came up with and so on. That's what that idea is. When a woman conceives, she's been given the word. The word. When a person conceives of an idea, it's, it's usually words that are coming together. And the, and the words, like a blueprint, are going to be pieced together, and they're going to grow, and then it's ready to... It's just like an architect sitting down with his, with his blank blue piece of paper, and he's going he's gonna to build himself a house in his mind, and it goes from blueprint to final construction. You, you kind of see where I'm going with this. Here is lust being conceived. Let's go back to Genesis chapter 3, and let's examine. In fact, let's open our Bibles there. Genesis chapter 3. I'm having fun with this. I've, I've got uh, four pages of notes, and I can tell you there's no way in the world I'm going to get done with this today. But I'm, I'm enjoying it. I'm being blessed by it. It's helping me. You know, you know what I like? about what I do, I like being reminded every time I talk into a microphone of how wonderfully amazing my Bible is. That's what I like. I need it. I need that kind of encouragement, sometimes more than others. But I open this book, and it just never ceases to amaze me the organizational structure and the beauty of the language of this Bible and its connectivity to every other thing in the Bible. Genesis chapter 3. Eve had not at this point ever eaten the, tr the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. She didn't know what it tasted like. Nothing. Nothing. She had been told by her husband that she should not eat of the fruit of that tree. And for all that we can see, she just, okay. I mean, why would we? I mean, we got all these other trees around here. And we have love. And so, never even entered into her mind until lust was conceived. And how did it happen? Again, there's racist haters out there. Um, Finnis Dake was one of them. Racist haters out there who say that um, the devil 
actually mated with Eve, and that's where Cain came from. Yeah, Cain was uh, the illegitimate child of Lucifer and Eve. Uh, wh where do you get that from? Uh, rabbinical tradition. And, you know, actually, if you, if you take Genesis chapter 4, verse 1, and you go to the original Hebrew, and you move words around, and you look up all these obscure meanings to it, then you can make it say something that sounds a little bit like the serpent mated with Eve, even though it's not there. You can do that. Oh, sure. Okay. But it's not there. But what did, what did the serpent do? We're, we have given no record whatsoever of the serpent ever mating with Eve. But we do know for a fact that something was conceived inside of her. What was it? Lust. It was conceived inside of her. Lust, when it is conceived, bringeth forth sin. And sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. The, the more I think about this, the deeper it goes. Here's lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life in Genesis chapter 3. Lust, when it's conceived, bringeth forth sin. Sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. Follow the trail here of Eve. The words coming out of the serpent's mouth, just like, just like DNA being planted in the ground by way of seed or seed being given to a woman. It's the same idea. It's words of a book. It's DNA. Here's the serpent conceiving with words in Eve's mind for the first time ever. Look at that tree and lust after it. And she did. When she saw that the tree was good for food and pleasant to the eyes and desired to make one wise, she did eat. Lust conceived, and it brought forth sin. Now Adam and Eve have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And sure enough, 930 years later, Adam dies. But Eve brought forth what? Death. She conceived inside of her womb, her physical womb, Cain, who was what? A killer. That's who he was. He was a killer. He was a murderer. Whew. Boy, this Bible. Mm. So anyway, you kind of get the idea of this. So this sorrows in Matthew 24. Child being born. Actually, Two of them. Back in Psalm 7, 14, he travaileth with iniquity and conceived mischief and brought forth falsehood. Verse 15, he made a pit and digged it and has fallen into the ditch which he made. Now Psalm 48. In verse 2, the Bible says, Beautiful for situation, the joy of the whole earth is Mount Zion on the sides of the north. Um, I saw that one day, and I think that may be related to Isaiah 14. How, um, I will sit also on the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north, Mount Zion. The city of the great king. God is known in her palaces for a refuge. For lo, the kings were assembled and passed by together. They saw it, and so they marveled. They were troubled and hasted away. Fear took hold upon them there, and pain as of a woman in travail. Look in Genesis chapter 38. I like this. Genesis 38, verse 27. And it came to pass in the time of her travail that, behold, twins were in her womb. 
she's going to give birth to two babies. This is um, Tamar. This is the... Um, Judah had two sons, and they both died and left him with no heirs. And Judah was in town one day, and he saw a woman dressed up like a harlot, didn't know it was Tamar, didn't know it was his own daughter-in-law, and went in, hired her, and, and slept with her. And now she's got his kid. Well, now it's two kids. And it came to pass when she travailed that the one put out his hand. And the midwife took and bound upon his hand a scarlet thread, saying, This came out first. And it came to pass. And why is that important? Because of the, the firstborn son blessing. And it came to pass as he drew back his hand that, behold, his brother came out, and she said, How hast thou broken forth? This breach be upon thee. Therefore his name was called Perez. Perez means breach. Perez, uh, prime minister of Israel, Shimon Perez, means breach. And afterward came out his brother that had the scarlet thread upon his hand, and his name was called Zerah. Uh, do you know which one Jesus, what bloodline Jesus came from? Matthew uh, chapter 1, Luke chapter uh, 3. It was through the line of Perez, not Zerah even though Zerah was the first born or first to break the matrix, Perez was the first one to come out. You're dealing with two different types of people. Um, where is that verse? Do I have it in my notes somewhere? I thought I did. Um, the Bible talks about, we, well, we read this the other day. Um, between Esau and Jacob. Rebecca was told, two manner of people, two nations are in your womb, and two manner of people will be separated out. But right now, they're both there. One of these days, the travail is going to come. And a woman that has twins, she doesn't give birth to one one day, and then a couple weeks later, the other one is born. It doesn't work that way. When one comes, the other one comes. They both come at the same time. Think about it. Two children being born. In this case, it was Perez and Zerah. Um, you can think of Jacob and Esau. Jacob being uh, sort of his mother's son, as it were. And Esau being, and he looked like an animal, all right? He looked like a beast. So you just kind of think, think along those lines for a while. Isaiah 13, 6. How ye, for the day of the Lord is at hand. It shall come as a destruction from the Almighty. Therefore shall all hands be faint, and every man's heart shall melt. And they shall be afraid, pangs and sorrows. There's another word for you to study. Pang. Let's see, where is it here? Pangs. Underline that. Go through the scriptures. Study pangs. They shall be afraid. Pangs and sorrows shall take hold of them. They shall be in pain as a woman that travaileth. They shall be amazed one at another. Their faces shall be as Katy Perry. Flames. Oh! Where is it? The picture. I was going to show you the picture. Um, here we go. Let me do this. And let me do that. And here is, from Katy Perry's video, you're a firework. She's giving birth to a baby who is the, the divine spark child that's the symbolism that's in that video again the, some lady said pastor mike there's two men kissing in this video you need to watch it and i said that but i'm going look at all this other stuff in here look at the sparks the divine spark in people look at that that's what's going on a tra let me go back to this imagery let me you you look at this 
And let me read Isaiah 13 again. How ye for the day of the Lord is at hand, it shall come as a destruction from the Almighty. Think about God destroying the earth in Genesis chapter 7. How did he do it? Water. How do we know that the baby is about ready to be born? Floods of water. Same thing. It shall come as a destruction for the Almighty. Therefore shall all hands be faint, and every man's heart shall melt. They shall be afraid. Pangs and sorrows shall take hold of them. They shall be in pain as a woman that travaileth. They shall be amazed one at another, and their faces shall be as flames. Did a Watchman video broadcast on this uh, several months ago. The power of the flame, I encourage you to go watch it. It talks about the divine spark, the spark being kindled. It only takes a spark to get a fire going. That's how it is with God's love. You remember that song from the 70s? We sing on the bus all the time, the church bus. Anyway, their faces shall be as flames. That's the, 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 flame of the, the flame of the divine that's in the Zohar that's being pushed by the Hebrew Roots people and the Kabbalist and everybody else and Morgan Freeman. That's what that is. Their faces shall be as flames. Behold, the day of the Lord cometh, cruel both with wrath and fierce anger, to lay the land desolate, and he shall destroy the sinners thereof out of it. But the stars of heaven and the constellations thereof shall not give her light. The sun shall be darkened and is going forth, and the moon shall not cause her light to shine. Now take that, what we just read, sorrows and pangs and travailing in birth, and the sun being darkened, the moon not giving her light, and the stars of heaven falling, and go read Matthew 24 again. Because Jesus gives us a little piece of it and says, uh, but these are the beginning of sorrows, but the end is not yet. I mean, we're travailing in birth, but the baby hasn't come out yet. When the baby comes, that's when it's going to be the end. But not until. And you see the same things in Isaiah 13 as you see in Matthew 24, Mark 13, Luke 21. In Isaiah 21, verse 3, the Bible says, Therefore are my loins filled with pain. Pangs have taken hold upon me as the pangs of a woman that travaileth. I was bowed down at the hearing of it. I was dismayed at the seeing of it. My heart panted. Fearfulness affrighted me. The night of my pleasure hath he turned into fear unto me. Isaiah 29, 21 verse 9. Here's the context that that's in. Behold, there came a chariot of men with a couple of horsemen. And he answered and said, Babylon is fallen, is fallen. Revelation 17, Revelation 18. All the graven images of her gods he hath broken unto the ground. Isaiah 42, verse 13. The Bible says, The Lord shall go forth as a mighty man. He shall stir up jealousy like a man of war. He shall cry, yea, roar. He shall prevail against his enemy. That's Katy Perry's song, Roar. I have long time holding my peace. I have been still and refrained myself. Now will I cry like a travailing woman. I will destroy and devour at once. I will make waste mountains and hills and dry up all the herbs. And I will make the rivers islands. Can't turn the page here. And I will dry up the pools. And I will bring the blind by a way that they knew not, and I will lead them in paths that they have not known. I will make darkness light before them and crooked things straight. These things will I do unto them and not forsake them. You've probably going, oh, that crooked thing straight. Where have I read that before? Isaiah 40. And you know what he said in Isaiah 40? He's going to make the crooked places straight. He says, comfort ye, comfort ye my people. It's talking about the Holy Ghost, the spirit of comfort. In Isaiah chapter 53 our Savior knew all about that. He was called the man of sorrows. 
Isaiah 53, 10, Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him, and he hath put him to grief. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see of the travail of his soul, and shall be satisfied. By his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. I want you to look at that verse 11. He shall see the travail of his soul. In Psalms, and, and maybe I'm just connecting too many things that shouldn't be connected. But it was in Psalms that we learned that our soul is a her, a she. Um, I, I had a verse that I wanted to look up earlier. I don't know if it has anything to do with it. Hang on one second. Yeah. Psalm twenty two twenty, deliver my soul from the sword, my darling from the power of the dog. Um, here it is in Psalm thirty five seventeen. How long wilt thou look on? Rescue my soul from their destructions, my darling from the lions. The word darling is used two times in the King James Bible, and both times it refers to the soul. And again, it's, I can't remember the verse. I have to look up the word her. <laughs> Hang on here, and we'll find it. Yeah, that word her, that's only 1,994 times in the King James Bible. Now, I don't have to, I probably won't be able to find it. But it specifically said in the Psalms that our soul, yeah, here it is, Psalm 34, 2. Thank you, God. You're pretty good. Psalm 34, 2, my soul shall make her boast in the Lord. The humble shall hear thereof and be glad. Think about it. Now, here's one of my favorite passages in the Bible, and we're, of course we're running out of time. I want you to turn to Isaiah 54. And we'll start on this, and then we'll try to pick this up on Thor's day. And we'll talk about this, this idea of a woman being in travail and a child that's going to be born. And what that means as far as the what happens in in um, in Matthew 24 and Mark 13 and so on. In Isaiah 54, we have a picture or a prophecy of God bringing restoration to the 12 tribes, to Israel, to literal bloodline, seed of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, that Israel. God is not forsaken. The Bible says God has not forsaken the people whom he foreknew. He's not forsaken. He, God doesn't foreknow somebody's going to be saved. And then when it comes up, you know, throughout the history of the world, it finally gets to their life, and they live their life, and they die and go to hell, and go. And God's going, oh, you know, I saw them going to be saved, and I, oh, I forgot. Ah, oh, doggone it. Oh, man, I was going to save them, and they died, and I just, I don't know where my mind was. That's not God. He foreknew them, and he foreknows Israel. God doesn't forsake his people that he foreknows. He doesn't. Sing, O barren thou that didst not bear, break forth into singing, and cry aloud thou that didst not travail with child. For more are the children of the desolate than the children of the married wife, saith the Lord. And here's what I want you to do. I want you to do your homework. Isaiah 54, Isaiah 66. Look at all the places in the Bible where pangs or travail or sorrows. Uh, study uh, these women who never had a baby, who finally had a baby. Okay? Think about that. Think about a story in the Bible where a woman is married to a man and she has his baby but then gives the baby away. Okay? You ponder that. And then think of Jesus departing from the temple. Okay? If the Lord allows, we'll talk about that on Thursday. But until then, 
Think Bible.